Good evening, everyone. I am Jamie Rose Eliyahu, President of the Board of Trustees of the Jewish Federation of Raleigh Carey. I am very excited for tonight's session and I hope all of you are as well. As of this morning, we've had over 100 people registered for this event and we've had many more signing up throughout the day. So definitely say hello to all of the other people who are here both on Zoom and on Facebook Live because we have more people tuning in over Facebook Live as well. So we're really excited to have so many of you here with us tonight. For our session tonight, I think we can all agree that this has been quite a year. In nearly every way, our lives have been upended. We've experienced loss and change on a massive scale, which we are still processing, and yet somehow we have made it to March 16th, 2021. Over the last year, the Federation and our agencies, the JCC, Jewish Family Services, and the Jewish Community Relations Council have partnered with our entire Jewish community to accomplish so much. When I look back at this past year, I can't believe where we started and where we have come to today and everything that we have moving us forward, looking into the future. In the last year, through Jewish Family Services, we have helped so many families who have increased need with food and financial assistance, and that has been so crucial to the community. We were able to host Camp JCC last summer, and we continue to plan for this summer, and we're doing so many things to get ready to have the best summer yet, as we always say. We had several interviews with local and state politicians um, in 2020 during this COVID time and helped us gear up for the elections in November. There have also been several anti-Semitic events that have happened throughout the last year. And the JCRC has helped to guide our community and those um, dealing with these issues over the entire time. We launched a new affinity group, the Jewish Business Leaders, and we're working on more events for all of our affinity groups moving forward. And we have lots going on with women's philanthropy. And also our PJ library just continues to grow by leaps and bounds. So we are very excited for everything that we have done throughout the last year and before that, as well as everything that is moving forward now. So as we begin to see the light of day, thanks to vaccine distribution and warmer weather, although maybe not so much today, um, the Jewish Federation of Raleigh Carey wanted to convene tonight's panel, as well as three additional panels to help our Jewish community imagine and discuss how our community has changed, what we've learned over the last year, and how we envision our community moving forward. I am really excited for tonight's speakers, but before we begin, I would like to thank our speakers and for sharing their wisdom tonight on our panel. And I'd like to thank our platinum level federation wide corporate sponsors, Bizcom Global and Active Healthcare for their support. And thank you to all of you who have joined us tonight, both longtime federation supporters and newcomers coming here together. Now I will turn over, turn over to the federation's new executive director who we are so thrilled to have and who we also hired during COVID during the last year, Phil Brodsky. And as I do so, let me just give you some words of introduction to Phil. Phil has over 15 years of experience in leadership of national Jewish organizations. Phil and his wife, Mindy, and their one-year-old son, Simon, who is very cute, joined our Federation in December of 2020. And after three months, it is already feeling like home for Phil and his family in Raleigh and as part of our Federation. Phil brings to us his brand of national leadership, as well as experience with nonprofit strategic change, creating a culture of philanthropy, relationship building, and a sense of creativity and optimism. Phil, thank you to you and the team at the Federation for organizing tonight's event. And now I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it's really great to be here tonight. I'm so excited for this panel. Um, 
as I came into the role, I was really thinking about, you know, what's one of the real values that we have for the community as the Jewish Federation here in Raleigh Cary. And one of the things that stuck out is that the Federation is really a um, center table for everybody in our community to come together, um, whether you're a member of a synagogue or unaffiliated, um, involved with Jewish organizations or just, uh, just Jewish, you know, the Federation is a place for us to bring together uh, the Jewish people here and their families for important conversations. And like Jamie was saying, uh, you know, it's, it's, we've made it through a whole year, which is hard to believe of COVID and we're still, we're starting to get out of it. We're starting to see the light. And I think there's one question on all of our minds, um, which is what is life going to look like as we get out of this? You know, we're starting to see some examples and some paths, uh, so tonight is really the first of four panels that we're going to have four community discussions to to um, to to look at this question in different ways. Uh, tonight we're talking about what is our Jewish community going to look like. Uh, we have four experts, four leaders of our Jewish community here, who have been thinking about this every day. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the experience they've had over the last year what they've learned from it, what they think um, they've picked up that will continue after. Um, once we, we get back to being able to gather, we like um, maybe changes that they're foreseeing, things that um, based on the last year we've had and what we've learned, things that aren't gonna be the same anymore. Uh, and hopefully with the, the help of all our community members out here, we'll have some nice uh, questions as well from everybody to really make this a discussion. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it's gonna be a great time. I know for me personally that uh, it's been quite a year full of change, both worldwide, professional and personal for us. Uh, Mindy and I welcomed Simon at the end of January, 2020. We had an amazing bris February 1st. Uh, friends and family came from all over. It was really an amazing day for, for us to have everybody together and celebrate welcoming our son. And then it was just a couple weeks later and, and we look back on that day, the bris that we had, just feeling so lucky that we got to see all of our parents, our friends flew in. And uh, we've looked back at that day multiple times just to take strength from it and, and remember the warmth we felt being surrounded by everybody. Um, and it's just been a year, I think, as everybody here knows, of Zoom Passovers and <laughs> Zoom bar mitzvahs and Zoom hangouts uh, just to stay connected with everybody. Um, so let's jump into our panel. Uh, our first panelist that I'm going to introduce, I will imagine that everybody knows, but I will give his introduction anyway, is Rabbi Eric Solomon, the senior rabbi at Beth Meyer Synagogue. Uh, Rabbi Eric graduated from University of Maryland, uh, but now I think he has some new allegiances to the teams here in North Carolina. Um, and after rabbinical school, spending three years in Jerusalem and three in New York City. In 2005, uh, he gained entry into the rabbinical assembly and arrived in Raleigh uh, to serve at Beth Meyer Synagogue that same year. Rabbi Solomon currently serves as the vice chair of the City of Raleigh Mayor's Commission for Compassion. He's traveled all around the world with American Jewish World Service, developed his spiritual practice with teachers from the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, and holds the tie and is the senior rabbi at Beth Meyer Synagogue. He's also married to Rabbi Dr. Jenny Solomon, and they have three kids. So thank you so much, Rabbi Eric, for being with us tonight. Um, our, our opening question for you uh, is that I think as we've all experienced, synagogues and congregations and, our, and congregants have had to adjust in so many ways over the last year. Uh, I mentioned that we're living in a time of virtual everything, services, holidays, weddings, life cycle events. So ha Rabbi, how have you seen our Jewish community in Raleigh adapt? Are there any positives coming out of this time that will stay with us as we move forward? Absolutely. Philip, great questions. And before I even respond, I just want to say how what a pleasure it is to be with you on this panel. Thank you, Phil, for making this happen. Everyone from the Federation, uh, Baruchim Abayim, as they say, welcome to our community. 
we said it before, we'll say it again. And great to be my fellow panelists who uh, I miss seeing in person, what a, but it's a real blessing to, to be here together again on another Zoom opportunity, which is just an honor to be here together. So um, this 64,000 shekel question you're asking is what we learned from this experience and what might we bring in. And uh, you give us some time to consider it. So let me give my little, uh, my, my personal Torah of the pandemic. And I think some of these things you all are going to know just as well and could easily answer this as well. But I was given this, uh, this tea of opportunity. I appreciate it, Phil. So the first thing is, um, is, is, of course, the use of technology and the unbelievable ability that technology has given us during this pandemic to come together. Some of you know uh, in my own congregation that sadly my mother struggles from Alzheimer's disease and is in South Florida, land of our people. And she's in a very beautiful facility that takes care of her wonderfully, thank God. Uh, actually connected to Jewish Federation in, in South Florida. But the only way I can interact with my mother over the past year is via an, an iPad. And even then, as the year has gone and sadly her condition has deteriorated, it hasn't been always successful due to timing and various things. So on the one hand, we know that the technology has been unbelievable for services on some level, for we've conducted rituals, like you mentioned, the name it's for namings, all kinds, we've done all kinds of things. Um, even sadly, people who've died, literally, we've done the final vidui and confession I have done on Zoom. At the same time, it, we also see the gap. So when we come out of this, you know, technology is certainly staying with us, and we've wandered with the technology, and it's helped us. It's helped us maintain community. On the other hand, it emphasizes the fact that there's nothing like me being with my mother, please God, eventually soon, God willing, and holding her hand and being in her presence, certainly for people who are not able to use technology well for various reasons, it, or just it's not possible for various reasons. And even the gap between those that have the right type of technology or the expensive technology, the, it is expensive to do it, and those that do not. So there's like a kind of a class gap and a privilege gap also with the technology we have to recognize as well. So going forward, technology will always be with us. The question is, how do we, we also see the gap in what we, what the emphasis on community. And we're here in the community business, which leads me to the second one, which is, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Priya Parker. She wrote a very famous book about gathering. And the idea of gathering is, um, you know, she be very firm. I don't want to summarize her book. She's the preeminent scholar. But her main point, if I had put on one leg, is that you have to gather for a purpose. That when you gather, there must be a reason why you're gathering that is unique, that attracts people together. Now, again, we're in the community business. We gather people all the time in various different ways, different types of age groups, different interests. But if we don't have a solid, strong reason to gather, then people will choose to just continue to do Zoom after it's over. So things have to be convenient. They must be of high quality. They must be things that bring people out of their house, not just because they you know, think it's available, because it's so compelling to be in person that they will be pulled to do so. So thinking about why we gather, where we gather, and who we gather with is gonna be even more important as we go through. And the last thing I'll say, I have a couple of thoughts about this, is that um, you know, the depth of the spiritual uh, suffering that all of us have felt, the universal feeling of suffering from the isolation and loneliness uh, that we felt from each other and the, the distance that technology does not fully do. It does something, thank God, but doesn't fully do. And that what it means to build community and how important it is, how precious it is. Um, again, we here are already on board. We already said amen for everyone maybe on, on this webinar. But in general, there certainly is a culture in our society for, for a few hundred years of strong, rugged individualism. And we've come to see that there's a downside to the soul of that individualism and forced individualism and isolation. So that we're gonna to need to come together. We're gonna to have to hold each other. We're gonna to have to find a way to come together with meaning and purpose and recognize that there are people who are suffering and struggling all the way through this. And the very last, last thing I'll say is that um, you know, no one got out of this unscathed. Everyone is suffering from it. It will take much time to carry those in my own shul who have sadly died of COVID or suffered from COVID specifically. And all those who've carried us through, the, the first responders, the medical workers, the essential workers, those who work for Amazon, UPS, at the Harris Teeter, the food line, et cetera. You know, these are people that we may not have appreciated the depth beforehand, but these are the people who literally have saved our lives, literally. And um, that's something I don't think we're, I hope we won't uh, let go of too soon. We'll hold that appreciation and gratitude 
going forward. That's my my take. Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah, I agree. I think it's so important. You're talking about gathering. I also just think Jewish community in general, we have to be really clear about the value we're providing for everybody to make sure that people want to continue engage and be a part of the Jewish community and invite their friends and family to it and, and pass it on to future generations. Thank you. Uh, next up, I'm really excited to introduce uh, somebody I actually went to college with, Hannah Spinrad, who is the current campus director at Hillel at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, prior to joining the North Carolina Hillel team in the summer of 2020, Hannah was the first Atlanta director of community engagement for Honeymoon Israel. She also worked in the development departments of the Jewish federations of Boston, Miami, and Atlanta. Hannah is a proud Tar Heel alumni graduating from UNC, as well as earned her master's in Jewish professional leadership and her, master, her master's in nonprofit management uh, from the Hornstein Heller program at Brandeis. Uh, and also, interesting note, she's a fifth generation North Carolinian. So Hannah, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, you are uh, the campus director at my favorite uh, college in the country, personally. Um, and over the last year, colleges have been in the news constantly um, as we've gone through the COVID crisis and, and the fallout from outbreaks. Um, so I'm wondering from your perspective, how have you seen college students been able to handle the pandemic? Uh, what have they needed from you and your team? Um, and what do they need from us in the community? Thanks, Phil, um, and thank you all. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, like Phil, I, I started my job in the middle of the pandemic and relocating back to North Carolina. And a few weeks after I started, as some of y'all may have infamously remembered, uh, we came back in person at UNC Chapel Hill and shut down after a week. Um, and that experience for our students was incredibly challenging. Um, they essentially left for spring break last year and, and never came back. And so going into this year, we saw a lot of skepticism and a lot of um, hesitancy to trust in the university, to trust um, in the sort of more adult adults in charge to make decisions to keep them safe, while also feeling that real pressure of, I miss my friends, I want my normal life back that we, we all felt. Um, and as Hillel, uh, what we did on all of our campuses, not just on Chapel Hill, we operate on um, all the statewide public schools in North Carolina, uh, was that we were guided by the value of Pikuach Nefesh. Everything we were doing, the value of human life supersedes all else. And how could we best model for our students that, that feeling of wanting to gather and wanting to be a community needed to be done in a safe way. So we wanted to provide a safe haven on campus, knowing that not all students had the same COVID uh, safety practices, not all students felt comfortable gathering, what is the best way we can connect students to each other, especially those who are first years or new to campus. So we did primarily go to virtual programming. And what we saw most often from students were a couple different things is how do I find my people and my friends? And also um, to real needs around mental health, um, that this is just taking a toll and being on Zoom virtually all day, every day, and then going back to living in a dorm in an apartment by yourself is just incredibly draining and challenging for those living at home, feeling like they were missing out. Um, you know, a lot of our students were coming to us from around the triangle, around the state, around the country, even we have some students from around the world. Um, who were logging in and just looking for that communal connection. Um, so we, we followed our students' leads and, and tried to formulate programming that uh, would be entertaining to log into after you know, eight hours of class on Zoom. And um, another thing that really came out of it was this, how do I do Jewish without my community? And how do I do Jewish in my own home? You know, these are students who a lot of them grew up in Jewish families with Jewish households where they were uh, internalizing their family's Judaism. And then Hillel would, would provide some sort of programming in Judaism and then they would go off into the world. And now they're four years earlier than they thought they were, they're doing Judaism on their own and they're trying to figure out how. So we've done a lot of programming around how to do Jewish ritual, Jewish practice, host your own Seder, host your own Shabbat dinners and those kinds of things at home. And 
uh, I could keep talking forever, so I'll stop there. Thank you. It's really, I think it's clear that Hillel has been able to really adapt to the virtual world and figure out a lot of ways to meet our students where they're at and something I think we can all, you know, look to as an example. Thanks, Hannah. Next, we have Rabbi Yisroel Cutler uh, from Chabad and Kerry. Um, Rabbi Cutler uh, moved to Kerry in 2010, giving Chabad and Kerry their first full-time rabbi. And Rabbi Cutler is no stranger to the South. He was born and raised in Houston and active in Chabad outreach activities in Texas from his early youth. After stu studying at Yeshiva in the USA, UK, and Canada, Rabbi Yisroel spent two years in Australia teaching, guiding, and mentoring Jewish teens. He then returned to the U.S. and received his rabbinical ordination from the Central Chabad Rabbinical Court in Brooklyn. Um, he's a great leader at Chabad and Kerry, along with his wife, Rebinson Hanna Kotler. Um, and we're so glad you're with us tonight. Uh, and my question for you Rabbi is about the Jewish family and how the role has uh, changed and developed over the last year as we've gone through this. Um, it was nearly a year ago that all of a sudden we're preparing for a Passover like we've never had before. Um, we've had to really host a lot of our, all of our Jewish uh, holidays in our homes away from being in the community, away from extended family. How have you seen Jewish families uh, adapt to this um, how's the role of Jewish family or Jewish family leadership changed or strengthened over the last year? And you know what what can we take from this as as we move forward? Great, great question. And hey, Phil, so good that you put this on. It's good, so good to see everyone's faces. One of the gifts, I think, just before we get into the question of this virtual gathering, is so many of us have seen how some of the more artificial walls that divide Jews up, whether it's a denomination or affiliation, it's, you know, it's a lot easier to hop on a Zoom call and go to a service over here, pop into a class over there, explore a dimension, a perspective that maybe you didn't hear before. And I feel that when we all went through this together, there was a unity that this call tonight really um, highlights so beautifully. And I'm hoping that we can take that with us even when we leave the virtual world, uh, please God. As for the holidays, yeah, it's, it's hard to believe it's it's the second Passover. We're going through similar things. For me personally, thank God, a little bit different than last year. Last year, I was preparing for Passover while recovering from COVID. This year, I am preparing for Passover after getting a vaccine. So tremendously grateful to have the difference from one year to the other. But nonetheless, for so many of us, it's without the extended family, without the community seders, without the friends, without the family, extended family. So it, it, it's very, very difficult. And what I like to remember is really every single time we go through a crisis, there is a rebirth that's happening at the same time. It's interesting how in Judaism, the word mashber, that's the Hebrew for crisis. It actually is the Hebrew word also for a birthing stool that women would use when they gave birth. In other words, the pain is birth pangs. There's something that is being born at the same time. And if you go through Jewish history, every time we went through a national tragedy, this is a national tragedy. This is an epidemic affecting the entire world. You think about every time the rebirth that happened to the Jewish people after the first destruction of the temple and the dawn of the rabbinic era and the synagogue and the study of Torah and through the pogroms, the way that led to it. And up to the Holocaust and, and Israel and rebirth of Jewish life, we as a people have managed to have rebirth every time. So I think about us being like a seed and, and you stick a seed into the ground and the seed doesn't like it. It's buried under dirt and it's decomposing. But without that, it's going to remain a seed. And, and this is the way it, it turns into a tree. And for the holidays you mentioned, yeah, we've lost the ability to have the family, so much has been buried in the ground. What has been the rebirth? The rebirth has been the Jewish family as the anchor of Jewish life. That's traditionally the way it always was. You know, it, it most mitzvot don't happen at the synagogue. They actually happen at home. The Jewish home and the Jewish family is Kodesh HaKadashim. It is the 
holiest place and what has been so inspiring for me to see and our role even as a synagogue is how to empower people as you mentioned hannah beforehand to experience judaism as a whole that at home that is a rebirth because what ends up happening is people take ownership of their judaism and they connect on the deepest level they don't depend on other people they don't depend on going anywhere but they're connecting and anchoring at home and when that happens something extraordinary happens i've seen during this year families asking me about shabbat observance families asking me about doing rituals like giving charity every day or making blessings before they eat or observing shabbat and in a sense that's even more valuable than going out to a synagogue or even a JCC to have that. So what I am hoping we can all remember from this is even after we come back to the JCCs and the synagogue, the holiest place is the Jewish family. That can never be taken away. God forbid a synagogue can, but when Judaism is strong at the home, then we have a vibrant Jewish community. Thank you, Rabbi. It is to really zoom out in history and think about how the Jewish people have adapted through so many changes is uh, maybe encouraging to know that uh, we're doing that in our own way now and that we'll come out with a stronger, more vibrant uh, Jewish community, God willing. Uh, thank you. And uh, our, our last panelist that I get to introduce tonight is Hannah Demick. Hannah, thank you so much for being here. Anna is the Youth and Programs Director at Temple Beth Orr. She's been working there. Not only has she be work, been working there for several years, but she also grew up at TBO. Uh, she's currently finishing her Bachelor's in Jewish Studies at Grass College online and will be starting her Master's degree in Jewish Professional Studies in the fall. She works closely with the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism. Uh, there are overnight summer camps, there are youth groups across the country. She's been a big part of think tank conversations uh, regarding the future of Jewish youth group after the pandemic. So Hannah, thank you so much for being here. We're excited you're here. My question for you is about our teens and our Jewish youth. You know, we've lost in the last year. My, my niece is 16. Uh, I was talking to her. You know, we've, we've lost in-person proms and homecomings and in-person school. Uh, I'll have teens you know, how have you seen our teens been adapting to this and, and how have you been able to continue to connect with them and connect them with Jewish life in our community? Uh, first, thank you for having me on this panel um, and thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, it's not news to anyone that the kids and the teens of our community have lost so much this past year. Um, as the youth group advisor for Ralph D at Temple Beth Orr, which is the Raleigh Federation of Temple Youth, um, they experienced loss right off the bat. They had been planning one of the largest events the kids had helped plan probably in the past decade, possibly two decades at TBO. And it was scheduled to take place March 13th. And as we know, we went into shelter in place a few days before that. Um, so we had to cancel that the week of, and so there was mourning right off the bat for our kids at TBO. And at first, you know, it seemed cool, like a couple weeks off school, no big deal, but it became very present very soon that, um, you know, it was more than just a couple weeks. It was proms that were being canceled. It was graduation ceremonies that were being canceled. Um, besides the teens, we saw bar bat mitzvahs being postponed and then postponed again and then postponed again. And then, either canceled or put on Zoom or postponed another year. Um, and then we saw summer camps being canceled. And that was a really, really big deal for the Jewish community. Um, I think once the summer camps were canceled, it kind of hit that it was real um, because it's such a big staple of the Jewish community. I was supposed to work at Six Point Sports Academy, which is um, the partnered organization I work with with the URJ in Asheville, North Carolina. and. Um, you know, I didn't get to do that. And for me, it wasn't a big deal um, being that I wasn't a kid that regularly went to this camp year after year after year, but there were some kids who um, like this was the year at camp. They'd been going every summer. They don't know how to experience a summer without being a Jewish summer camp, truly. 
Um, and there were kids that were looking forward to these traditions, these community rituals in the Jewish community that they didn't get to experience. And not just that, like prom and graduation at school, secular experiences that they didn't get because of COVID, because of the pandemic. And uh, there was a real mourning process like, for our kids. And it was difficult uh, because we as adults in the community, as leaders, we were also mourning our own experiences. We did not know that this was going to happen and we were trying to adjust on our own. And so it was difficult to adjust on our own as well as support the kids in this process. Um, but by supporting the kids, we learned that they needed each other more than ever. And in the first few months, you know, we had to cancel youth group events, but the kids chose to put their extra time into planning Zoom youth group events. And that was what they chose to do with their time because they wanted to see each other. They didn't know what else to do with their time, um, but they knew they wanted to be together somehow. And so I found myself on Zoom a lot from day one. And it was mostly with just the kids hanging out there because, you know, they didn't know what else to do. And as we've gone through the pandemic, we've seen the kids get more used to what it's like living in a pandemic as a kid. Um, there are kids finishing their ninth grade year that have never stepped foot in their high school. It's wild. There are kids that were born a year ago that have never seen a playground full of kids. And it's very, very weird to think about. And that's going to be a big change for those kids as they come into a world where the pandemic is coming to an end. Uh, that new normal is going to be completely different. It's not going to be like it was in the past. And the kids, uh, I mean, what we can do for them is to prepare them for that the best that we can, because we don't know exactly what we're walking into either. But we know that there are ways that we can adapt and we have adapted. Uh, we are used to the concept of Zoom mitzvahs now. And, you know, there's benefits to these things too. Uh, we can have our relatives from all over the world join our kids for their bar bat mitzvahs online that wouldn't have gotten to come otherwise. Uh, I have gone to a couple funerals on Zoom and there are people that wouldn't have been able to go to that funeral in person if it, but they were able to come because it was on Zoom. There are things that we have gotten through virtual experiences and they don't replace the immersive experiences for our kids um, but there is value in those and I think the challenge is going to be going forward and figuring out how do we take the value of those virtual experiences from this past year and integrate them with the immersive experiences that has made the Jewish community um, survive this long in our Jewish youth population because I mean, studies show that the past couple of decades have uh, lived on through our youth because of immersive experiences, um, because of summer camps, because of Jewish youth groups like Nifty and BBYO and USY. And it lived on this past year, even though they weren't in person. And so though it's gonna look different, I think that it will still live on, but it's going to be different than it was in the past. Thank you, Hannah, and, and thank you everybody for your, our opening comments. Uh, just a note on our agenda, what we'll do is I'm gonna ask a, a couple questions to our panel here, probably two. Um, we have a couple questions that community members have submitted, so we'll get to those. Uh, and then uh, hopefully time permitting, there'll be an opportunity for anybody that's watching to type in questions uh, for our panelists tonight. Uh, so my first question for, for the whole group here is, um, we've been talking about different aspects of community and how it's changed, um, moving online, uh, new roles that we're having. Uh, Hannah just mentioned that it's not just necessarily our local community we're working with, but we're you know, connecting with people um, from all over the country or the world with some of our programming now. Um, so the, the theme of the panel is you know, reimagining our community. How has the concept of community changed uh, as not just over the last year, but where we are now and what you're thinking moving ahead. Um, all the adaptations we've made, has that impacted your thoughts on what community is, where it is? Is it in our building or is it in the home or is it in our virtual space with everybody around the world or, or our Hillel house? Um, you know, how, how, how have your thoughts evolved on this? 
I'll chime in and I'll, I'll just share that. One of the blessings for me personally as a rabbi, sometimes we can get caught up in the sermons we give, or the services that we lead, or the programs that we direct. During the last year, the focus has been on the individual. I have loved being able to make and have the time to take the phone and to call person by person to check up on them. I've loved having the time to knock on the doors of my Hebrew school families and seeing them at home. And for me, that recognition that just like the holidays, strip it down to the core and it's about the family. Who am I as a rabbi, not someone who gives sermons? A rabbi is a spiritual healer. A rabbi is a teacher. A rabbi is a spiritual mentor. The focus on the individual for me has been a tremendous change and one that I want to take with me. And I encourage everyone during this year, how we have checked up on everyone all the time, that needs to be what we stick with us because community begins with the individual, with the love, with the care. That's going to be most impactful. And I encourage everyone listening here that when you call the rabbi with a personal matter, don't feel that you're taking the rabbi away from what they should be doing or could be doing. No, this is the most tremendous. This is what a rabbi is. And I encourage everyone Whatever you're going through, pick up the phone, no matter what time of day it is, call the rabbi. You are allowing us to do your job. And community means the care for one another. It's been incredible to see the way all of us have been concerned with those that are vulnerable, vulnerable or alone and being able to maintain that past this year. Um. I would say working with college students, a lot of the common ways or incentives we would get students to come to Hillel were no longer available to us. Uh, large in-person gatherings, free food, um, none of, all of that was off the table. Um, so to echo something Rabbi Eric said earlier, this concept of why we gather and what is truly important in our community, uh, something we've leaned into this year that I think will continue on is um, these micro communities and cohorts. Um, with the loss of immersive experiences like birthright um, or you know, the ability to sort of build your social networks organically on campus, uh, we've had to facilitate that for people. And it was, has been incredibly interesting and impactful to learn um, how people identify and also what they're interested in learning about Judaism or um, like what, what they're willing to explore. So uh, looking into the future, knowing that those large in-person gatherings may still be very far off. Um, how do we continue to organically um, connect people to their micro communities that make the university community or the North Carolina community a little smaller for them? And the other thing that has been a huge um, change for us as Hillel, knowing a lot of our students um, are living at home with their parents, our Hillel community has broadened people, bring in their parents or grandparents or siblings um, or pets for virtual Friday night celebrations or um, for Jewish learning or for, for different celebrations on campus. So I, I actually feel our community has greatly expanded in this virtual reality. And I hope that's something that will continue to happen. So if anyone listening uh, has college age kids, um, I promise you their school is doing virtual programming. Please hop on, we would love to have you. And if you have to swing hand or you, not yet. Go for it. Okay, awesome. I'm just so enriched by with my colleagues here. It's a pleasure to be in this conversation. What a privilege, what a good. Here's what I, I want to offer just another kind of angle dovetailing what's been shared here. Um, the question I think that's going to be remarkable for our work in the Jewish community, but I really, of course, think it's beyond that, but I definitely hear it from all of us here, is the question of why buy something locally when you could buy it on Amazon. Meaning, if we're going to offer a program on the internet, why would someone tap into the Jewish community of Raleigh Carey, and I'm not picking on the Federation, it's the same thing about Meyer, why my shul, when some other shuls and other perhaps larger cities, larger Jewish communities with larger budgets and larger technology and blah, 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 could offer something fancier with more bells and whistles and you know more professionalized perhaps. What is it that will attract people when they're choosing either on technology or, and I think it comes down to some of the things we're, we're mentioning here. In addition to focusing on why we gather, it's the Torah of relationships. You know, again, with my, my colleague, Robert Cutler, and I said in the way with the individual, you know, 
What makes it unique is that we know each other. And so in, it was already this way before, but this is increases the need to be in contact and in relationship with as many people personally as possible. You know, the old Cheers thing, you know, where someone knows your name, you know, that's what Amazon can offer. And that's not what some larger federation or larger Jewish community or larger shul can offer is a chance. Somebody to know. Now, the question upon me as a rabbi is, do, am I doing, am I, is my community is spiritual core, is it doing that outreach? And then you add in the fact in our community, we have so many newcomers, including newcomers who come during the pandemic, including our new executive director of the Federation. And how do we, or even Hannah, sounds like also Hannah Spitter, gave it but how do we get these, these, all these newcomers, which I think we expect, I'm not a prediction of the future, only the Holy One knows, but it looks like even more will come after the pandemic. How are we going to integrate them and build that relationship that feels like this is what's special? I may get a better quality of, a picture because of the internet, you know, quality framing, I don't know, at some synagogue in Manhattan, but here, this is my community. This is my shul. This is my Jewish community. That's going to be an interesting question. And I think that we have to think about not competing on the level of like flashiness, but on the level of intimacy and connection. Um, not easy, not easy. It's, it's a quality value. I think it's a quality. Uh, I'll go off just a little bit of what Rabbi Solomon shared, and uh, it's a great thing to consider, and it's something that we are considering um, as clergy and full-time staff members at uh, religious organizations. You know, if you can attend High Holy Day services at any synagogue in the world online, why pay for tickets at a local shul if you just moved there, right? And or just in general, um, and those are the questions that we're asking. Because what what makes those in person experiences unique? And uh, those of us that have been in our communities for a long time, like we know what that feeling is like. But bringing that feeling of community through a, a computer screen is difficult because we've never done that before. That's never been the aim of the Jewish community to bring in to like bring people into our community through a screen uh you know as like Jewish community we thrive off of hugs and seeing each other and waving and walking into rooms together and um eating uh, at the own egg together you know like that's our thing and so um you know those experiences are so special to us and um focusing on how we can bring similar experiences back into our community are going to be really important because we've found ways to make that work for the past year. But we see now more than ever, like how important those experiences really are to the people, the Jews in our community. Thank you. It's so, it's so interesting what y'all are saying. And um, something I've thought about is I've been now in my role for three months and at the Jewish Federation and some people I've met and I feel like we're friends now, but I've never met him in person. I mean, I've only, you know, talked talked over Zoom or on the phone. Um, and I know that when we meet in person, we might forget that we haven't really met in person before. <laughs> so it's a totally new experience. And um, one, one thing I want to reflect back on as well is one of the things that got me into this work is my belief in community, this, this kind of goes back to, um, you know, why buy local? Uh, there's this great book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and it's famous for the 10,000 hours theory that he wrote about. But there was another chapter where he looked into the different cities and towns all over the world where people live the longest, those outlier cities. And what he found was that the one thing those cities had in common, or towns, I guess, was that when people walked around, people, they, they knew each other in the street. People said hello to one another. So there was a strong social fabric. And I think nothing can really replace that. And that's what we're talking a lot about at, at Federation. And it picks up directly with what all of y'all just mentioned is the importance of the one-on-ones, the importance of making those personal invites uh, and making sure that uh, the Federation and our greater Jewish community platform is a place where people feel welcomed and engaged and, and are, are connecting to one another uh, so that we can empower them as um, leaders and, and families and, and uh, um, volunteers, people that are working to improve not only our Jewish community, but Raleigh and ultimately our, 
our universe that we're that we're living in. Um, well, I, I want to ask one more question, then we'll get into the community, which is, um, you know, we've it's already come up a couple of times about mental health, helping make space for grieving. There's been a lot of loss. We're at the same time on the precipice of a lot of excitement. I cannot wait to go to my first concert again and, and you know, be shoulder to shoulder with people. I think that's one of the things I miss the most. How do we balance those two things? How have you found in your organizations working with different age populations, you know, um, how, 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 can, what, how can we hold space for grieving and loss while at the same time feeling okay about being excited about um, getting back together with one another again? You know, we're about to go into Passover and at the Seder, there's this idea where the, while the sea was splitting, the Midrash writes that the angels were singing praise to God and God said, now ain't the time to sing. My creatures, the Egyptians are drowning. You cannot sing. And there's a question that's asked and that is the Jewish people themselves were singing a song at the time of the splitting of the sea. So what do we mean you can't sing? And the answer is angels in Jewish thought are one dimensional. Humans are complex. We are able to embrace more than one emotion at the same time. And therefore, when we embrace one, we do not reject the other. Our experiences are full enough to do both. And I trust that we are able to rejoice every time we have a simcha together. And that in no way rejects the pain at each and every loss. Similarly, the other way around, that when we have the yard site, when we have the shiva, when we have the loss, we can be fully present and afterwards be able to go to the simcha afterwards. We're big enough, our hearts are big enough to contain both. Thank you, Rabbi. And when, I'll just I'll just add in just to dovetail what the rabbi said beautifully is um, you know we are in the memory business us Jews we're all about and we are carrying I mean it's just, if I if I had to narrow it down to one of the greatest challenges of what it is to be a Jew is to on the one hand hold thousand years years of Jewish history where we've suffered enormous pain I and mean, it's a famous Talmudic passage how can we celebrate after the temple is destroyed we should stop drinking water we stop having wine stop eating meat everything you look at reminds us of the temple's destruction and yet we find a way to live in those worlds that the rabbi uh Kadla mentioned beautifully I, I think the only thing I just want to just push a little further also is that um to be sensitive to the the story we tell about these particular the losses we've had because in you know there's been there's been a disconnect because sadly in my, in my own congregation, those who have died, there's been a distance because of the technology has been a distance. And even the shivas has been a distance. And while I have actually cried many times, maybe, I don't know, even sometimes more over Zoom in some ways, because it's so, the distance can be also very painful and poignant. And it's remarkable how you can feel close. You know, we haven't been close. So I think it may take some time to adjust to remembering what it's like to be in the presence of the morning. And I want to say just to your, your point within myself, uh, Phil, you know, I think that we're going to want to celebrate and just like dance the horror and get a people up on the chairs. And I get it. And I don't think that's wrong, by the way. I think we should celebrate the amazing vaccine. I mean, it's unbelievable how quick this has been. You know, please, God, don't want to give us a kind of hurrah. Hopefully it works out. But I agree, like, how are we going to continue to hold that and not forget that might be actually a Jewish kind of recipe, what we can offer. And it's actually an interesting question. Passover is about celebration. Passover is also about our slavery. How do we hold those two things together? It's a very powerful question as we go forward. I don't have an easy answer. I think it's a really important question too. And thank you, Rabbis, for um, sharing your perspective on that. Um, you know, I think it's very possible for us as Jews to celebrate while, um, remembering exactly where we came from. We do it all the time. Uh, and I absolutely think we should continue to celebrate the things that we have today while remembering the things that we've lost and the things that we've experienced. Um, and, you know, 
I lost things and experienced struggles during this past year that others didn't, and I didn't experience the same struggles they did. And something that I'm going to focus on personally and as a leader of the community is to ask others what they need instead of assuming I know what they need because not everyone had the same struggles I had this past year. Um, I didn't have to homeschool my children for the first time, right? Uh, I didn't have to postpone a wedding or get married uh, or, you know, um, or do a drive through graduation when I, you know, I didn't experience certain things of those. I did experience isolation in my home with my dog for this past year, and I've only hugged my mom maybe three times total. Um, and so, you know, I'm preparing for things like that. I had different struggles than others did. And so um, a big th thing for me is going to be asking what other people in the community need, asking how we, I can support them. Um, what resources can I provide? Uh, what circles do they need to talk about what they went through? You know, um, we can't just put it to the side and pretend it didn't happen. That's not what we should do. It's not effective. We take our struggles and we build off of them and we find strength in our struggles. As Jewish people, we do that. As human beings, we do that. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to rejoice uh, and be able to hug my mom again. Um, and I'm also going to look at hugging my mom differently than I ever have in the past. Um, because I know what it's like to not hug her for more than three times in one year, even though she was 30 minutes from me. Um, and that makes it, it's going to make it a lot more special moving forward too. Um, so this is a great question. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to move into some of our community questions. Uh, we have uh, one that were, that's been, that was submitted ahead of time. Uh, we're going to show that video and then take a couple questions that have been in the chat. Okay, that was a great video. I didn't hear the audio. Um, but we have Carol Larson, um, who is asking, I'll just read her question, uh, but Carol, thank you so much for submitting your video. Um, and Carol asks, uh, how can we stay connected during the high holidays this year? Um, are are y'all foreseeing that this will be in person in any way? So uh, I'll just chime in, we will be in person, obviously socially distanced, please God, by then, most of us had had the opportunity to get a vaccine, but if God forbid, it's not working as planned, I know we will, we put a great emphasis on finding safe ways to come together. If it's outdoor, it's outdoor. If it's socially distant, socially distant. If it's masks, it's with masks, but to do whatever you can to both follow the guidelines, but also give those who do feel comfortable an opportunity to come together in person. give anyone else a chance to any of the hand that's <laughs> um okay so uh i mean look i wish i could make an announcement tonight i mean i i'm with rabbi israel Kadler. you know it, it, uh, we are certainly going to have the yom kippur will happen this year I, i'm confident of that god willing but in terms of how this will happen i mean it appears it will be a hybrid i i don't think me and my uh partner in crime rabbi jenny solomon can do another high holidays via just video and there <laughs> you know from my own soul so we're going to do everything we can. Having said that, exactly, we don't know what, what the future provides. We don't know what safety exactly will be. It appears definitely will be a hybrid of some kind and uh, in all likelihood, some attendance in person for programs, including outdoor opportunities, as the rabbi mentioned. But I will say that in all likelihood, going forward, even if, if, if Dr. Cohen of our state said everyone can come back together and be together, there will be people that will not feel comfortable. So we are committed at our congregation, I imagine across here, doing everything we can to be inclusive with our technology, continue to support that, to make it as available as possible for everyone to participate. And will that, that is no doubt, that will be the case, I imagine, in my shul forever. I don't know, I hope that it's not the primary choice for everyone, 
But I think forever, where our technology option will be higher. I'll give us one example. We had a congregation, a family in our shul that moved to Maui, Hawaii during the pandemic. And they kept their membership and participate and love it. And they're going to come back once, once a year or so, maybe for the high holy days. So, you know, it's, it's interesting what this is going to mean about the future of this connection. For some, this will be their sole connection to technology. So we're never going to let that go. Yeah, we're, we're following the hope for the best, plan for the worst mentality as, as we have all year. Um, you know, our, our hope and intention is that we'll be able to do something safely, uh, probably outdoors again to that point of, yes, sometimes we do have that urge to celebrate and we want to be in large groups. But when it comes down to it, frankly, sometimes even in the new Wegmans down the street for me, the idea of being around a lot of people just makes me uncomfortable still. And, and it's going to take us a while as a community to feel comfortable, especially, um, to, I believe Hannah said it earlier, so I'll be dealing with not just first years, but essentially sophomores and some juniors who have never been in person in the whole community. And, and so for them, this is all a first time experience. And are we going to be comfortable engaging with people we don't know if we're leaning into community and looking for community? How do we make sure that community is accessible um, to people who may feel hesitancy around that? So I'm also envisioning, again, some sort of a hybrid model um, and, and uh, leaning into we have a wonderful network through Hill International of um, some virtual services and things from around the world as well. Yeah, I got a I got a really interesting question that came through in the chat. Um, and I guess the backdrop, I'll just add one element to this question and ask it, which is over the last year, not only have we been dealing with uh, the pandemic, but we've been facing other major societal ills as well. Um, certainly we've seen here in our community, uh, a rash of anti-Semitic events. There was the Nazi flag. Uh, there was a swastika graffiti at the UNC Chapel Hill campus. Um, but uh, over the last year, we're not just facing anti-Semitism in the country. And we have a question uh, from Michael Isaacs, who asks, um, related to last year's events that opened our eyes to the depth of systematic racism in our country, you know, how are we all thinking about um, our role as leaders in the Jewish community, our organizations to, to how are we all reimagining our role in contributing to an anti-racist world? So overcoming, you know, it's kind of, I think in Michael's question where, you know, it's on us to overcome a lot together. So however you all want to take that, what you're thinking about, maybe some of the things you've, you've done already. I can share from a, for the youth perspective, um, our congregation is really involved with the Religious Action Center and we have continued to stay involved with them and throughout the pandemic. Um, and we have made it a very centralized goal for our uh, youth in our community, especially our teens to be involved on a social justice level um, and advocating for what they believe is right and um, equality in the community and fighting that hate. And um, it's not an easy thing to talk about, and I think that uh, the teens have shown me, especially uh, how big of a voice that they have and that we can have in our own community. Um, and I believe that we can take the hate and the struggle uh, within our society from this past year and um, take it and combine that with all that we've experienced over the generations. Um, and continue to fight that together as a community um, and be strong. And um, I think the youth are prepared and ready to also stand for um, what they believe is right. And uh, it, I, I believe that they can do that too. Since I also semi-represent the, the Gen Z crowd, uh, I'll quickly jump in. Um, you know, something we constantly talk about at Hillel is how people bring their whole selves and their whole identities, not just their Jewish selves. So uh, we have our, our Jewish community is diverse. Um, you know, we have Jews of color and we have people who have multiple identities that they hold um, in addition to their Judaism. And part of being an inclusive Jewish community is making sure that they have space and that they feel safe in this community. And uh, lots of little things like having a conversation about 
uh, security for the high holidays. And is a police presence going to be welcoming to every single person? Some Jews may walk in and feel safer with a police officer there. Others may be incredibly intimidated to walk through that door. And so what does that mean? And um, frankly, our students are phenomenal at sort of paving the way on that conversation. And another big uh, priority we've had is as the Jewish organization on campus, how do we make sure that we are being active members of our larger community and we're not only serving the Jewish students, but how is our Jewish values and our students' Jewish values informing their presence and being inclusive uh, members of the community. So a lot of our work has been um, reaching out to other student groups, the BSM, the Latinx group on campus, um, and making sure that um, we're building a diverse community and inclusive community at Carolina. I'll, I'll just add for one kind of internal comment and one maybe external comment to the powerful work shared already, which is, um, you know, one of the comments that's made in the, I guess, rabbinic community in the in this the activist rabbinic community is kind of a looking back to Abraham Joshua Heschel and Martin Luther King and a kind of time during the 60s and, and important and valued. And by the way, the rack was built out of that, the religious action of that kind of spirit. And it's incredibly admirable. And these are the heroes of my rabbinate, frankly. Uh, my wife too, we really look to these leaders. However, back at that time, the framing was, it was then say blacks and Jews, or we might say African-American citizens and Jews. And we know that that is not, that is a beautiful history, but that's not the correct framing for now as Hannah Spinner I just noted, it's we, <laughs> we, including Jews of color, we with not, we might say, others who are not Jewish of color or of other diverse backgrounds. We have to look at ourselves and not be, not be ignorant or denying of the diversity within our own community and, and, and the ways in which we, in ways that are perhaps subtle, and that's the anti-racist teaching that I've been reading all the books that perhaps everyone has as well, that we are unaware, including myself, and how I'm perpetuating a certain white supremacy of our society. I'm not proud of that. I'm not looking for this, clearly. It's an awareness. And how do we as a congregation and in a Jewish community raise our awareness in what, not, not to say, you know, wh why are there not enough Jews of color, et cetera? What are we doing to prevent potentially Jews of color from being part of our community? What are, how am I sadly, to my shame, and, and, and somehow participating in that? That's the question that we as a Jewish community leadership, others have to ask. And at the same time, I think the other piece of it is about the way we speak up, which I'm very proud of, and, and Phil, I wanna commend you in your early tenure, so quickly to deal with the crisis, few crises, and, and Hannah Spinner at the UNC, I mean, your early tenure also, you know, had to deal with Nazi flag and swastikas, but that type of stepping out and speaking up, not only about the Jewish community, but really upon anyone in any community, is going to be the litmus test as to whether I think even Jews are going to listen to us. If all we do is simply speak out only when we are the ones attacked, although I think we should, by the way, no issue, and I fully support it. But if we don't, aren't consistent across any group that's being discriminated against, regardless of what that background may be, um, then we will be perceived as, as, as not in solidarity and, and simply looking out only for our own good and not looking out truly for the better of humanity. That's very see-through. My own daughter, at a two, who's 18, would not tolerate that. So it's a very key point about how do we keep speaking up wherever we see discrimination occur in any place. And I'll finish on a, a positive note. I, I really am a believer in humanity. I think a better humanity is going to emerge from this pandemic. We have seen for the negative, how sensitive, how cognizant we have to be of, vac of bacteria and of catching germs. People have been so careful about their surroundings. We see for the negative, how much contagious it is. I believe we're gonna see that for the positive. We're going to see the power of a mitzvah. We're gonna see the power of kindness. We're gonna have a movement in which kindness is going to go from person to person to person. People are going to uh, just treasure relationships, treasure connection, treasure tzelem elokim, treasure one another more after this. May it be Hashem's will that we see this in the world and we emerge a much better humanity from here. And we can all play a role being as careful as we were beforehand, not to spread the virus, to be just as careful afterwards to spread love, avat Yisrael, and mitzvahs. Thank you. That's a, I love that beautiful sentiment. And um, I just want to say 
from the Federation perspective, our JCRC is doing a lot of work both to bring together the different leaders in our community when we need to speak out against anti-Semitism, but also to make sure that if we're doing that, speaking up for all of our allies and, and communities that we hope we can ally ourselves with to make sure we're speaking up on their behalf too, if they're faced with, um, if and unfortunately when they're faced with uh, similar uh, hatred in the community. Um, so we're about at time. Um, why don't we do a quick go around? Uh, I think Rabbi Yisroel, you just kind of took maybe what my last question was going to be with your answer, which is a nice bridge, but um, maybe we can just do a quick go around for all of us. Um, it has been quite a year. And again, we're on the precipice of hopefully something, a, a beautiful year ahead. Um, for each of us, what is one thing that as we look back um, on the experience that we've had, being faced with crisis, overcoming loss, pain, uh, enjoying the one-on-one -on -one connections that we've been building, um, and all the adaptations that we've, that we've made, um, you know, what's one thing that we can say that uh, truly over the last year that a, a change or an instance or something new in our lives that, that we're grateful for, you know, and that we want to take with us as we move ahead into from here until March 2022. All right, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I would say what we've learned around innovation and iterating and um, accessibility in this environment has been incredibly interesting and valuable um, when we're operating in the virtual space. Um, I think, again, without the trappings of a lot of our easy default ways to program or entice people to be together, we had to really examine the why and, and make it compelling. And also it expanded and challenged everyone, um, students included, to, um, to innovate and learn and, and find new ways and creative and safe ways to engage with their Judaism and to connect to each other. And I, I just because we can go back to a, a free bagel doesn't mean it should just be a free bagel. And how, how do we make sure um, that we, we, we keep that spirit in our programming, even when we have access to all the other things in our toolkit is something I'm looking forward to. I uh, am looking forward to implementing new ideas that I didn't realize were ideas that could even exist. Um, I think, I know for me, I get very comfortable in the way things are and when things are going well, I think, well, this is the right way to do it. Um, and, you know, the pandemic was a way to get me and my colleagues thinking about, well, maybe there's other ways to do it. Maybe the way that we've been doing it works, but maybe there's other ways that also could work. Um, maybe there's ways that this could even be more effective or reach out to the community in greater, um, in greater lengths. And I am excited to look at all the things that we've been doing and that have been going well, or perhaps haven't been going as well as we've wanted them to, and look at the possibilities that they have in the future and what we can change because um, we've seen that change is allowed and it works and it can happen and that uh, the soul of the Jewish community lives long, long past the physical presence of the synagogue. And that's why we're all able to be here today talking about this. I'll, I'll simply add that I, I, sadly, I do think that the pandemic has emphasized a teaching that I, you know, all of us know intuitively is that everyone is suffering. Everyone is suffering. This pandemic, some are suffering more acutely than others, but everyone is suffering. And um, no one gets away from it. This has been an incredibly egalitarian suffering in the sense that everyone's had to face fear, isolation, loneliness. It's, I, I, as, as hopeful, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with the Hatikva group here with Rob Cudler, but uh, there are moments of despair. Will this ever end? 
you know, there are things that were missed that won't come back. There will not be another bat mitzvah in the same time, in the same way. That's a, that's a deep, profound loss that's not coming back. Now, we can, God willing, we'll be creative. We'll create some alternatives. We're already thinking about this. But so to feel that loss, I hope that I, but all of us, carry that when we go forward. The sense when we see people in our congregations, we see people on the street, we see people we do know and don't know so well, to remember that a lot of Rahmanas, as they say, everyone is going through challenges. And can we hold on to that feeling even when things return to remember that? Yeah, I'm optimistic there's going to be growth for all of us on so many levels. We had so much reflection, so much time for introspection during this time. I know personally during this year, we've been planning and planting the seeds for a center of Jewish life in Western Wake County, please God, so building the seeds for the future. But what I encourage everyone to do is to kind of bottle up and even write down everyone we have the feelings that are very strong right now. And I encourage everyone to write down one or two, three things that you will hold on to, and you'll be able to read a little bit later on when please God, life comes back to normal. Um, whether that is the love for one another and caring for one another, or it's gratitude for something as simple as health. I'll finish with a short story. There was someone I know, 92 years old, he was in the hospital with COVID. And when he's leaving, thank God, he left the hospital and they give him his bill. They give him the bill and he looks at the bill and he breaks down in tears. And they get all nervous and someone speaks to him, I'm sorry, sir, do you have difficulties paying here? We can work out a payment plan. And he says, no, that's not the issue. I was on life support for 24 hours and I'm seeing how expensive the oxygen was and how much I have to be thankful for for the 92 years of breathing God's air in this world. So I hope all of us can bottle up all of the tremendous things that we are so grateful for. And please God, we should only be able to experience those feelings in good times and in simchas together. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you to all our panelists tonight. I really appreciate y'all taking the time to do this. We covered so many different topics, um, and as one of my mentors used to always say that our discussion is over, but the conversation continues, and we got a lot of questions in the chat. We had other people send in videos. Thank you for everybody that did that. Um, you know, this is really important to us, a federation that we are creating space for us to come together and have these discussions. I hope everybody found uh, several points that you'll chew on over the rest of the night and upcoming weeks. Um, I am here and available to talk about these topics with everybody, as are our panelists as well. Um, if you don't have their email addresses, I'd be happy to connect you if you want to follow up with anybody. Um, I think it's really important that we're having these big discussions all together across all of our agencies and organizations. What do we want our community to look like? Um, there's one lesson. I think everybody can remember exactly where they were this week, one year ago. This was the week when everything started closing down. The NBA canceled their, put a halt to their season. I think we all can remember where we were. Um, it's just incredible to look back and see how much change and can happen in just one year. So hopefully next year at this panel or next year at this time, and we're getting ready for Passover 2022, we'll look back uh, to this spring and just again, look back and think how amazing how the world has changed again, how much we've overcome, uh, how much we've been able to heal, uh, physically, spiritually, as a community, overcome all many, many different ills that we're facing uh, as a people. And uh, I wish that for all of us. So the conversation continues. Please stay in touch. Um, if, you haven't, if we haven't talked one-on-one -on -one and you're still on the Zoom, would like to connect, I, I'm, I'm very happy to do that with you. Um, we do, I do wanna plug uh, two upcoming events. One is this Sunday evening, uh, Federation's Women's Philanthropy is ho hosting a schmooze. If people want to get in, get more involved and find a connection to some of that community, that's uh, March Sunday, March 21st uh, at 7.30. You can find more information on our website. And the other one is our JFS actually worked with a group of Holocaust survivors in Raleigh through the pandemic over the last year in a program called Cashier. 
not only did they have the experience, but we filmed it and made a documentary about their experience uh, and their and what we can learn from their experience overcoming trauma through their lives and including this last year. Uh, the film premiere, the worldwide film premiere of Where Can I Go is April 8th at 7 p.m. More information about that is on our website as on the Jewish Family Services website. So um, those are two upcoming events. In terms of our panel that we're on tonight, this was the first of four sessions that we're holding. The next one is gonna be about public space. So what, you know, it's, it's not, we're in addition to reimagining Jewish life, what's it gonna be like to go to the movies? What about where are we gonna be working from? What about shopping? What about concerts? Some of this public space, public health concepts. Uh, we're gonna have a panel of local uh, business and policy and health leaders um, have a conversation about that. That will be um, information about the exact day and time is coming out soon, but it will be in May. And we're really looking forward to that. Um, the other two panels we're going to host, one will be about civics. So specifically to Michael's question about how do we overcome other uh, societal ills that we're facing and, and connect within Greater Raleigh. Uh, and the final one will be about the food industry. What is the food industry going to look like? Uh, will we be going back to restaurants? And, and how are local chefs thinking about that and local other local uh, food industry experts? So that's what's coming up. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to everybody that tuned in uh, tonight on Zoom as well as Facebook. Um, and uh, I think we all look forward to being in community with you in this year ahead that we're imagining together. Good night, everybody.